And here she comes down to the basement. A woman I'm so happy is a friend of mine. Amy Blacklock is here. How are you? I am great. How are you, Joe? I'm good, but I have to say that I certainly miss the Detroit area personal finance community where you and I would see each other there for a couple of years. And that was a painful part about moving away. I'm like, I can't move from Amy. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> no, I loved having you around here. And yeah, this is a lot farther trip to the basement now. So it is. Thanks it was, for that. I was glad on the world tour for the book, you could include us. So that was, yes. that was awesome. But let me ask you this, Amy, why you and a book about estate planning? Like, why did this hit you that you wanted to be involved in this project? We were approached by Adams Media to write this book, and we jumped right on board because we think it's such an important topic. Two-thirds of Americans do not have an estate plan. I had recently went through an experience with an aunt and an uncle and found how important it is to really have an estate plan, have it updated. While they had wills and uh, powers of attorney, they weren't updated. Um, they also didn't have information easily accessible. So when I jumped in and had to take over, it, it was just a mess. So wanted to make sure that people understand how important it is, no matter how much money you have, no matter what age you are, et cetera, that you really do need to get a, some essential documents in place. You cover this right at the beginning of the book, which I was so glad to see, which is a lot of people, as you and I both know, think, well, an estate, that sounds like something rich people have, Amy. Right. Tell me what really is an estate plan and why do we all need one? Well, your estate plan is much more than just saying who gets what assets when you pass away. Your estate plan includes um, having a power of attorney in case something were to happen to you and you needed somebody to jump in and just pay your bills. Make sure that your, uh, you know, your rent's paid, your mortgage is paid, that kind of thing. And you're that could be, and that could be as simple, not to cut you off, but that could be as simple as you're in the hospital just for a month or two or whatever. You know what I mean? You have some serious injury and can't get to it. Somebody can do it on your behalf. Yes, correct. Yeah. You know, something simple. Yeah. Accident, you know, accidents happen to people every day. Unfortunately, you could be disabled and unable to work for a period of time. You could be in a coma, you know, and in that situation, you are going to need somebody to make some decisions for you regarding your finances or even your health care, perhaps. And so you'll need a health care power of attorney and a financial power of attorney to do those things. And then a will, a basic will, even for people with limited assets, those will help others in your life navigate your estate when you're gone. And your estate could be, it might just be a checking and savings account with a little bit of money in it, or it could be property that you have. It could be, you know, personal possessions. And then the other thing that a will can do is it can name a guardian for any children that you have. And so that's uh, super important so that you have a say so in who uh, is looking over your children and who is handling your, your finances. Are there important things to think about when you're choosing these people? Like, let's let's think about, you know, you talk about for your, your aunt and uncle taking care of their estate. You were the person taking care of their stuff. Are there important things that we should think about when we're choosing those individuals? Sure. You want to think of people who obviously are trustworthy, <laughs> that, uh, you know, uh, have, a, have a good head on their shoulders. But not even that, uh, you know, it helps to have somebody who understands finances, who can navigate the legal system. But even thinking about things like, does a person live close to you? Um, because if you have somebody, if you're in Michigan and your uh, son is in California, it's a long way for him to try to handle something for you, especially when they might have to have court appearances. They might have to come to your home and, and look through, you know, documents, get rid of your stuff, sell your house, those kinds of things. So if you could name somebody that's even, you know, in close proximity, that will also be helpful. You also want to consider people's ages, honestly, um, because depending on when you're creating your estate plan, if you're looking to have, you know, a power of attorney or an executor that's 20 years older than you, you know, as you age, you might need to, to rethink that and, and name somebody else later. I've heard of that younger people that never redo their estate planning. They have, you know, mom or dad as their person take care of it. Mom or dad dies before they die. They pass away. They never changed it. Now, all of a sudden, they don't have anybody in charge anymore. Exactly. And that's kind of what happened with my aunt and uncle. They had named power of attorneys who later fell out of favor with them and the family and things like that. And so I needed to do an emergency measure where I had to go to court to be named their caretaker. What if fun. You, if you will. That sounds like a great time. 
Yeah, it was. That's, that's sarcasm for people that can't hear it. You right up front talk about if you fail to do this, if you don't have a will or a trust or you don't have the people named in your document, you make the point that you really still kind of have a plan, but it might be ugly. Correct. The state will come in and make decisions for you, such as possibly naming the guardian of your children or who will get your home or who will get your um you know, the, the money that's under your mattress kind of a thing. If you don't name that person who you, your heirs and who you want to, to benefit from your estate, the judge will decide that for you. You know, people outside Michigan might not get this joke, but Amy, you'll get it. Back when I was doing the old rubber chicken dinner seminars about financial planning, I'd talk about estate planning and I'd say, the state has a plan, exactly what you said. But then I'd say, you can see what they've done with our roads. Imagine what they do with your kids. Like it is, <laughs> and people outside of Michigan have no idea how bad our roads are in the Detroit area. But <laughs> oh, they're horrible. If we yes. can't, if we can't trust them with that, how can you trust them with the rest of it? So you talk about in in one of the early chapters of the book who to consider in your planning. So let's dive into that even more because you talked about a few of these people, but you say that it starts with you. What does that mean? What that means is that you want to protect yourself. You need to protect your assets, your um, income, your property, just yourself. So, for example, going again, thinking maybe the worst if an accident happens and you are in a state of disability or what they call incapacitated and you're not able to make decisions for yourself, you want to have protections in place so that somebody is taking care of you. If you don't name a person, That's, again, where the state could step in and name somebody to make those health care decisions for you or, you know, your finances kind of a thing. The other thing is is just protecting your estate from, say, you're not in a coma, you're not incapacitated, but you're disabled and you're not able to work. By having disability insurance, that helps protect your income so that you, while you're recovering, you're able to pay your bills, that kind of a thing. Then it also, you want to protect your family by you having the disability insurance helps to, you know, even take care of your family by you having life insurance that will help to take care of your, your heirs and your family when you're gone, that kind of a thing. You talked about a will. A lot of people listening have also heard of a trust. What's the difference between a will and a trust when it comes to building your estate plan? There's actually a a pretty big difference. There's a variety of trusts that are available to people. There's a living trust, which you would have while you're alive, and you would manage uh, your assets within the trust. There's also trusts that don't start until after you pass away. And in that situation, the trust holds your assets versus them going to specific beneficiaries. The trust manages the assets. The benefits to this is a big one for a lot of people is that any assets in your trust are private, meaning they won't go through probate. So your uh, where a will will become public knowledge, a trust, anything in the trust is private knowledge and people you know, won't be plastered in the newspaper, that kind of a thing. It's also beneficial when you have situations in your, in your family, such as a, somebody with special needs or you have children from previous marriages, and you want to make sure all of your children are protected as well as your current spouse. Having things managed in a trust is a better way than to make sure everybody is covered and um, nobody's left out, I guess, if you will, where in a will, you might not have all the protections that you need. If it's, So a will for somebody with simple estate not a large family, everything's clean, cut and dry. They don't own a lot of property. A will is probably all they may need. But as you accumulate assets, as you accumulate property, as your family grows, maybe get divorced or remarried or your spouse passes away and you get remarried, things become more complex. And that's when you may want to turn to a trust. I would think special needs children too, I would imagine. Yes. Yeah. It's a big thing. Yes. There's there's two different ways to do this that you list in the book. There's software out there, or you can hire an attorney. Do you have an opinion about which one of those is best? When you have a very simple estate, I think you could DIY it. 
for example, the, in reading this book, we think that the book will give you enough information to feel comfortable to DIY your own plan if you have a very simple estate. You also can DIY like your healthcare proxy um, or some people call it the, the advanced healthcare directives. Those kinds of things, sometimes you can DIY. But when you get into the more complex estates, again, blended families, that's when you really should speak with an attorney. And you might think you can DIY it, but I always, one of my favorite sayings is you don't know what you don't know. And I think that's where an attorney can really help you out. I couldn't agree more. I feel like Sometimes back when I was a financial planner, there were people that would try to DIY this. And I thought your family's going to have to hire an attorney later anyway. Like your things are so messed up that your family's going to, why not like interview people while you're live and have this competent plan. And then your family will have somebody to turn to. But also on the other side, I saw people spend thousands of dollars when they're, you know, their situation's so straightforward that just a computer program would be super easy way to go. I'm thinking about, as I say that, though, I'm thinking about the Aretha Franklin situation where she had several different wills. They were all handwritten in that type of a situation. Obviously, you don't want to have four different wills. And allegedly, she had written wills out, you know, in quick succession, one after another, supposedly. How often do you actually want to redo your will? Number one. You want to redo your will anytime there's a major change in your lifestyle or life situation. For example, getting married, having children, getting a divorce. Those kinds of things should trigger a change in your will. Other things that might trigger is all of a sudden you, you inherit a large sum of money. You might want to update your will. You get remarried and now you're marrying somebody who has children from a previous marriage. You might need to update your will. There, there's a lot of things that really could trigger it. Maybe an executor that you had named passes away. You need to update your will. So there, there's a lot of situations that could cause you to update your will. However, you can, it doesn't require necessarily the updating of the whole will. There is a, what they call a codicil that will allow you to update your will or add to your will or make a change to your will without having to update the entire document. Uh, the next question there is thinking through Aretha's situation. So she has these different wills. You know, part of me that doesn't know a lot about this goes maybe, maybe if if she had filed one of those somewhere. But is there somewhere that you file your will? Is there something? Do you get it notarized? Like if you do a will yourself, like a, reportedly she had done, is there something that I do with it? Yes, you do need to have it. It's going to vary a little bit by state. Potentially, but you usually need to have two witnesses sign the will, and these witnesses cannot be a beneficiary of the will. So it has to be two, a couple of independent witnesses, and it lots of times has to be notarized as well. Okay. What if I want to cut somebody out? What if I don't want somebody to get any of my money, and I want to make sure that that I disinherit this person? We found the best way is to actually state in your will that you are disinheriting an individual. So first of all, we want you to think carefully before you actually decide to disinherit someone. Especially if it's me. Don't disinherit me. Right. <laughs> but if you do, it's best to explicitly state that in your will that you are leaving so-and-so, you know, zero or you disinherit somebody. And the reason for that is so that Later, they can't just say, oh, I was accidentally left out of the will. Uh, like it was an accident, like they forgot me. So if you state that you are disinheriting them, then there's no question. You might want to, instead of disinheriting them completely, just leave them something very small. Again, kind of so they can say, you know, they're getting something. They don't feel like, you know, you're, you're, you're totally leaving them out. They're getting a little something. But again, it's a very delicate situation that you'll really want to think about. I know there's some other financial planning tools uh, from reading the book that you have that can also help with the estate planning. Tell me about like workplace plans, like like the 401k or at your bank. It seems, but on those accounts, you write that there's some some ways that I can pass those on. That's a part of my plan. Right. Not everything has to be listed in the will. For example, your 401ks, your um, IRAs, even bank accounts. 
um, you can list a beneficiary on many of those plans. Um, some of them are called a transfer on death beneficiary, and some one are called some are called a payable on death beneficiary. But your your bank accounts, checking savings, those kinds of things, you can go right to your bank and ask them for the payable on death or the transfer on death paperwork to set that up. So if something were to happen to you, your account would go right to the individual that you've listed as beneficiary on that. Your IRAs, your 401ks, those kinds of things, life insurance, you will list beneficiaries on those so that those do pass on to whoever you're named. And it seems like when you're updating, you want to remember to update those too. I mean, I could totally see somebody forgetting to update that and has somebody, the wrong person listed. Yes, that happens a lot in um, divorce, from what I understand, is people forget to update those and then something happens and give an all the money to the ex-husband, right? Getting, getting the money, right? Right. Yeah. But the other thing to make note of is some people think, well, if I put it in my will, then it will go to whoever's in my will. Well, that's not the case if it's an account that has a beneficiary. Your beneficiary on your account will always trump what's in your will. So if you think I'm leaving my uh, my bank account at Chase to my son, well, if he's not listed, the listed beneficiary on that account, he's not going to get that account. Oh. It's going to be whoever's listed as a beneficiary. Is there a way to make it so that I fill out that paperwork, but it defaults to the will? Like, can I write it out saying I want it to go to whoever's in my will, then I can only... You know, instead of going to five different places, Amy, to update everything, I can just then update my will from time to time and all of this kind of flows into it. Can I do it that way? No, not my understanding yeah. is if it's whoever is on the beneficiary of that account. So, for example, you might have a Vanguard account or a T. Road Price account and you might have a something at work 401k or life insurance through State Farm. All of those are going to have their own individual beneficiaries. And unfortunately, you are going to have to update all of those who that is. That's not what I want to hear, Amy. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> well, well I, I shouldn't say that. You know what? A trust. If you have a trust and you name the trust as the beneficiary of those accounts, then the trust would inherit everything. And then, then that'll take care of all of it. That set up. Uh, so much research went into this, by the way. You go through everything from funding your uh, final care to what if your will gets contested to leaving property to kids to, as you mentioned, the different types of trust and how the trust gets administered and uh, so many different things. I know that with all the work you put into this, there must have been something that surprised you. What surprised you while you're working on the book? Probably what surprised me is really it's such a complex topic, but it really can be distilled down to easily understandable information, anybody then can get it done. When you hear the words estate planning, it just sounds like, you know, something that uh, is just going to be filled with legal jargon. Uh, it's going to, again, be only for those who are rich or wealthy. Yes, we did a lot of research. We did a lot of reading, but it really comes down to just a few you know, things that you really got to know. Uh, you have to understand your finances and your estate, what money you have, what money you owe, and, you know, how to take care of, you know, people in your life and yourself. And it, it's not, you know, as they say, rocket science. Yeah. It's just, it just takes some time to understand all that you have to do and implement it, but it's not hard to understand. But, and I love that too. And it's a little like riding a bike too. Once you know it, it's, it's not going anywhere. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know, little things change, but nothing big changes over time. I feel like. Right. Right. Hopefully your estate just grows. You have more money. You can then, you know, make sure Joe's a beneficiary. You yeah, know. Absolutely. If you want to make sure you have your favorite podcaster in there, I'm all for it. That would be great. The book is estate planning 101, a crash course in planning for the unexpected from avoiding probate and assessing assets to establishing directives and understanding taxes your essential primer to estate planning. And I'm assuming that it's available everywhere. Yes, available everywhere. That's so awesome. Congratulations, Amy, on a job well done. And thanks for hanging out with us and geeking out over estate planning. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. And one more thing I did want to mention, we do have some free tools. Oh, on, good. On um, our website, womenwhomoney.com slash estate 
planning tools. Okay. And we have free checklists there for doing estate planning. We have some information on legacy planning, quite a few different resources for that will be available. And I'd be remiss, by the way, of course, Women Who Money on its own is an award-winning website and just fun to go hang out at anyway. There's a ton of stuff there, but it's womenwhomoney.com forward slash estate dash planning dash tools. And you know what? If you're walking the dog or you are driving right now, we've got you covered. We'll have a link to all things Amy and to the tools that she and Vicki have at womenwhomoney.com. Thanks a ton, Amy, for hanging out with us and geeking out about estate planning. I, I appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me, Joe. Really appreciate it.